plastic and reconstructive surgery. The week after that, we have inventions in medicine, intellectual property, and entrepreneurship among clinicians. And the week after that, we have technology in medicine, robotic surgery. Join us on Zoom or YouTube Live at 7 p.m. CST for these sessions. Next slide, please. Here's the virtual shadowing working group comprised of Reagan, Shayan, Taylor, Ali, Rachel, Miriam, Elena, Ani, Kiana, Aditya, and myself, as well as our four physician providers, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Marchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno. And now for a quick announcement from Dr. Fowler. Welcome everybody. It's so good to have all 200 of you already. Uh, it's, it's wonderful for our 62nd lecture. We cannot believe we've been here already almost 15 months. We put 120 hours of shadowing online for you. The admissions committee season is opening this uh, next month, August. And so it's gonna be very important for us to examine and see how admissions committees treat virtual shadowing hours. My inclination so far is that I think it's probably gonna be quite positive. I know that several of our admissions committee members at UT Southwestern, where I'm on the committee here, uh, have spoken to our group here. So I'm, I'm hoping to encourage you to come back to these sessions, which we think are quite helpful, uh, because in part, the uh, virtual shadowing hours hopefully are going to count. I don't know, but I will keep you posted. Um, it's been a very successful program, uh, and we've had over 55,000 entries into the virtual shadowing website since we started at uh, 36 countries and over 1,000 universities. So clearly, this has been um, a message that has been carried around the world. We are deeply honored. We're here because of you. Uh, it means a great deal that you come back week after week. And uh, I will say that we, we had the competition uh, for practice interviews, and we have completed four practice interviews, which was kind of funny. And um, the, an impressive thing, uh, one of the practice interviews that I did the student had done 90 hours of virtual shadowing, which I thought that was just really wonderful and quite flattering for us as well. So Rohit, take it away and uh, the Q&A and then introduce our marvelous guest for the evening. Thank you. As usual, we will have two Q&A sessions, one near the middle and one at the very end. If you have a question, please put it in the chat as we go along. Don't direct message it to either myself or our presenter tonight. And also please hold any questions about the quiz until the very end. This session will be about an hour and a half to two hours. And with all that said, please welcome Dr. George Adesino. Thank you guys so much. Um, you know, I'm so impressed with this, your organization and all of your efforts and especially hearing um, you, Dr. Fowler, just everything you guys are doing. Um, I'm beyond impressed and definitely privileged to be with you guys. It's funny because I, I watched a couple of them already. And so I already feel a lot of a pressure. You guys had so many great talks um, and I hope to be counted amongst that as well, too. So without any ado, let's just jump right into it. Forewarning, I talk a lot. I'm a, I'm a chatter and I have a lot of pictures. So if we go over, please stop me if there's any pressing questions for sure. So I do a lot of mentoring um, from high school students, um, medical students, fellows, residents. And the number one question everyone asks me is how do you get or how did you get to where you are now? So how did I go from this chubby little guy on the left to who you see before you now. And you know, there's a lot of answers. Some of it is, is luck, it's being in the right place at the right time, um, it's hard working. Um, I think it's a mixture of everything, but honestly, I owe a large part of my success to my parents. Um, I was actually talking with Dr. Fowler before we started this presentation. Um, I am first generation Nigerian American. Um, so my parents immigrated from Nigeria in the early 70s. And I'm always just so impressed when I talk to them, the amount that they struggled because they really did both, uh, they both left a fairly comfortable um, and cushy life in Nigeria to come here for better opportunities for their children. So these are just some pictures, some of my favorite pictures of my parents, my mom, the top left, we always call that our, our Vogue Nigeria picture there. Uh, my dad in his very, very 70s um, outfit on the top right in Afro, um, and then them in the middle, that's them currently. Um, my parents literally, they poured everything they had into me and my brothers and sisters. And um, we, there's kind of a running stereotype with Nigerians that usually Nigerian kids end up being doctors, lawyers, pharmacists, and engineers. And we kind of have a little bit of, of everything. My um, oldest sister is an industrial engineer. 
my other sister is a school psychologist and then my younger brother is a lawyer. So we're kind of all over the place. Um, but my parents really did well by us. Um, they really had to start over so many times. And I always tell my dad, I think if he was born here and had the same opportunities that I had, I really think he probably would have been a physician. Um, but unexpectedly, both of my parents actually found their way into the healthcare field. My mom became an EKG tech and a stress test, stress test technician um, at Memorial Hermann. And then my dad became an echocardiographer. So he performed heart ultrasounds at Methodist. So they both were in the cardiology realm. Um, and then eventually they actually started their own um, business and they actually own a school teaching cardiovascular uh, uh, technicians um, how to do um, echocardiography. So they've really come a long way, but cardiology has always been in some shape or fashion part of my life. And I think that's kind of partially where my desire to be um, uh, in the medical field kind of came from. On top of that, I mean, I was a very sickly child. <laughs> I was always in the ER. I probably know every ER and urgent care on the Southwest side of Houston. If there was a flu or, or cold or something going on, I literally got it and got the worst of it. So I was in the ER a lot. And so I was always amazed with how I could go into the ER feeling like it was the worst day of my life. And then this physician would show up, make me feel better. And then I was kind of, you know, done and felt, you know, 100% better, which is kind of what Dr. Fowler does. And I'm sure he gets that all the time. And so, George, your mother had a close call. There was a sick patient and she gave a hug to a family member in Nigeria, and it turned out to be what? So actually, no, my, my wife, actually. Oh, it was your wife. I'm sorry. Yeah. So my wife, um, by trade, is a social worker. And when we lived in Dallas, um, she was in the ER. And the very first Ebola patient, his wife, my, my, his wife, my wife is in very close contact with. So we had a very, very close scare. And at that time, we were thinking about starting a family as well, too. So it was a very, very stressful um, time. But thank God she ended up testing negative for Ebola. So, yeah, we've had a definitely couple of scares for sure. Thanks, George. Of course. So being in the ER, you know, I really just saw the magic, the kind of the magical side of medicine and always was intrigued. But as you can tell by these pictures here, the struggle was very real growing up. I was very um, awkward and very introverted. So I really had kind of trouble relating to other people, expressing myself and making friends. And so I always thought that I didn't have the personality to be a physician because how could I, you know, join a, a field of, of a, a job that required me to speak with people every single day. So one day, you know, I was in my music uh, class and the music teacher heard me humming and she said, hey, you know, I think you have a talent. I want to put you in this choir. And she talked to my parents. She told them there was this local choir called the Fort Bend Boys Choir and they were local, but they actually traveled the world singing. And she said, I think this would be really good to get him out of his shell. And my parents literally signed me up the next day because they were desperate to just get me out of my shell. And sure enough, you know, I, I rose through the ranks of the choir and within a year or so, you know, I went from being this horrible, you know, horribly shy, introverted kid to then traveling the world, going to Austria and Switzerland and Mexico, you know, with no parents. With, there was adults, you know, chaperones and supervision, but with no parents. And so it really drug me out of my shell and I really started to feel myself become more confident in who I was. And I think that's when I first started thinking, you know what, me being a physician, this might actually be possible. So I always credit my parents as well as that music teacher for, for allowing me to kind of get out of my shell and kind of really putting me on the, on the, road tra the roadmap uh, for uh, a career in medicine. Hey, George, so, uh, my, yes, mother, uh, my mother was the choir master in my church, and I started singing under her at the age of six. Oh, nice. And on into high school, uh, th through college, through my, I was in the men's glee club at Georgia, and uh, and did opera in medical school. <laughs> so oh, wow. it's funny that somebody uh, pointed out once to me, the wonderful mix of music and medicine. Isn't that something? I love that. Look, so yeah, that means you owe me a duet later then. We'll, we'll have to. We'll have Absolutely. To are you, are you, you still a singer? <laughs> I try. So I, I was singing um, in the church choir up until I started my first attending job, but that's actually one of my goals for 2022 is I want to get back to it because I, I love having something outside of medicine that just, you know, gives you pleasure and it takes your mind off of everything. That's actually one of my goals for next year. <laughs> Keep going. All righty. So, yeah. So, like I said, you know, I, I had that inkling to want to be a doctor, but, you know, still really didn't have my confidence. Um, I started when I kind of started making the decision, I actually started shadowing my pediatrician 
And I really just wanted to immerse myself in medicine and try to figure out, is this something that I really wanted to do? And, you know, she was a very nice lady. She was an older woman, kind of on her way out uh, and wanted to retire. And I remember she said, you know what, you want to do cardiology. You've been talking about cardiology. Why don't you go and find a young black cardiologist, pick his brain, talk to him about his struggles, how he got into cardiology and get somebody that you can relate to. And I think that's when I first started noticing the lack of diversity um, in our medical community. So of course, you know, I'm aging myself. So this is before we had smartphones and you could Google easily. I literally had to search phone books and talk to different people to try to figure out if I could find a young black cardiologist. And it was like finding a unicorn. It was like finding a needle in the haystack. And I was just so kind of amazed or surprised that, you know, living in Houston, Texas, one of the most diverse cities in the United States, and I couldn't find a position that looked like me. And that really, really bothered me. And unfortunately, you know, that lack of diversity has kind of followed me throughout my matriculation in school and also in my career as well. So if you can see that top picture to the left, that's my medical school class. I graduated in 2000, uh, 2011. And um, the, the bottom picture, those are the, all of the African-Americans that were in our class. So our class was about 250 and we had less than probably 20 African-Americans that ended up graduating in our class. And the crazy part is we were actually celebrated as one of the more diverse medical school classes, but still that's such, that, that low percentage of what the general population is, you know, African-Americans account to about 13% of the United States population, but we're only about 4% of physicians. And this was kind of the first eye-opening awakening experience that I had that kind of reaffirmed that. Unfortunately, you know, this has kind of followed me throughout my career. So again, in residency and in fellowship, I was either the only one or one of two in certain cases. Um, and in fact, in my, my job currently at Kelsey Seaboard, I'm actually the very first African-American cardiologist they have ever had. So we have a ways to go when it comes to lack of diversity. And this was very, very shocking and eye-opening to me. But on top of that, I think what really sealed the deal is on top of there being a lack of diversity, I really started to see that there was a disparity and an inequality when it came uh, to medical care on top of that. So those mix of those two things, that really lit a fire underneath me. And I think I made a very firm commitment very early on that not only did I want to be a physician, but I wanted to be a part of, of fixing this diversity issue and, and, and righting these inequality wrongs. And so ever since then, you know, you can ask my family, my family members, everything from that point on was me dedicating myself to becoming a physician. In fact, my whole entire family at that point started calling me doc and they still call me doc up to this day. I'm pretty sure my nieces and nephew don't even know I have a real name because they literally call me uncle doc. So they were kind of speaking this into existence after I kind of made this commitment to myself. And so once I knew I, I, I had to do this, um, you know, I, everything again, in high school, I really immersed myself um, into getting as much medical education and medical experience as possible. So I would highly recommend everybody, whoever's interested in medicine, whether it's PA, um, being an NP, being a medical physician, find a mentor. I think that's the, the, the number one thing you should do because it's a very hard journey. It's a long journey and you need someone that's well seasoned and well versed to kind of guide you through this process, teach you things that they've learned along the way and hopefully allow you to avoid the mistakes that they made. Two, I would definitely say is to immerse yourself as much as possible. So every summer in, in middle school and in high school, I was always either shadowing a physician, I was doing some type of summer program, volunteering at a, at a blood bank, something to get my mind on the medical side of things at all times. And this really helped in regards to building my resume. And it also gave me a lot of things to talk about anytime I had an interview as well. So I would highly recommend that for everybody. Once I did decide, you know, I, I really, I really focused in high school and I was actually, I was all set to go to UT Austin. I had a scholarship, I had my bags packed and I was completely ready. Um, and last minute, right before the application process ended, my best friend at the time told me, like, hey, you should check out this school called Xavier University of Louisiana. It's a small historically black college, but they are number one in putting African-Americans in medical school. And most physicians can trace some type of origin from that school. And I had never heard about it. I was completely closed minded. I was set on UT, but my parents drug me there anyway. Um, literally, as soon as I stepped foot on that campus, I fell in love with the environment, um, with the atmosphere, with their science program. And I knew for me, it was a place that I needed to be. 
And it, it was probably the best decision I made. So I don't have a lot of pictures from college. Again, I'm showing my age. Facebook actually came out while I was in college and my original account got hacked, thank God, because I have some pictures that don't, no one needs to see. But this uh, picture of the top left is actually uh, one of the few pictures I have from college. It's me and my fraternity brothers. And everyone there is either a pharmacist, a lawyer, an engineer, and most of us are doctors. So it was a very, very good decision for me to go there. And I would highly recommend that um, you look into it as well. I essentially, I coasted through college. I did very well. I kept my head down. I kept my head in the books. And I was, I was kind of setting myself up for, you know, what I saw for my future. But unfortunately, you know, being in New Orleans in 2005, that is the year Hurricane Katrina hit. And, you know, I was already living off campus, but literally the week before the hurricane, I had just moved every single possession that I owned from my parents' house to my off-campus apartment. And Hurricane Katrina essentially came and destroyed everything. So that was kind of the start of some issues that I had my senior year. I unfortunately, you know, experienced uh, a loss very close to me, had some very um, troubling interpersonal issues with some other folks as well. And I, it just really messed up my mind frame. And I think if you talk to anybody who was in New Orleans in 2005, I think the city as a whole, we collectively kind of underwent this kind of state of depression, honestly. So I wasn't in a really good headspace, but unfortunately it was literally right before I was supposed to take the MCAT. And instead of listening to my mentors, which is another tip, make sure you always listen to your mentor. Um, instead of deferring it, I took it and I completely bombed the MCAT. And I mean bomb as in crash and bomb. Like I might as well have written my name and returned it to them. That's how bad I did. And being stubborn and not being used to failing, you know, I, I was a straight A student. I had a 3.8 GPA in college. I was used to just getting everything on the first try. That was a really big blow to my ego. And of course, being stubborn, I took it a second time and I didn't really change my studying habits, my attitude. I didn't address the underlying issues that were going on and I bombed it a second time. So for somebody whose whole entire goal from middle school up until then was to be a doctor, I mean, I, I effectively literally thought my life was over. I had no idea what was going on. I had like a, a 21 year old life crisis almost. And so I kind of had to take a step back and, and analyze what was going on. I knew early on, I wanted to get my master's of public health while I was in medical school anyway. So I actually took a gap year and I, I enrolled last minute into Tulane School of Public Health. Um, I enjoyed it, but about the third month there, I kind of realized that I, 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 had, I couldn't give up on my dreams to be a, a doctor. And so I really had to humble myself because I was just so embarrassed that I had failed that immensely. I mean, I literally had my whole family and friends calling me doc and I couldn't even pass the MCAT. So I really had to just you know dust the, dust the dust off of myself I studied, didn't tell anybody I was studying for the MCAT, um, took it secretly, did not tell anybody, and, and I blew it out the water. I applied that next round to about 15 schools, got into every single school, um, and, and that kind of just set me, set me back on my trajectory. So I ended up going to UTMB School of Medicine, uh, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. And the other tip I would say is I would definitely pick whatever professional school you're going to go into. Don't just pick it based off a of location or based off of its, its prestige. Really take an honest look at what the school has to offer, its curriculum, and how well you can immerse yourself in it. So does it align with the way you study? Does it align with the way you learn? Will it be compatible with your mental health? All those things are really important, and that's why I chose UTMB. That picture at the bottom left, that's my mom, uh, a picture that uh, my, dad, my dad took of my mom and I. And again, they were so amazed that I even pulled this off because my failure was so big. So it really set me up for this really good comeback. Um, after I graduated from medical school, I actually went to um, Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. So that's that picture at the t uh, in the middle there. Um, I did my residency there and I actually stayed for fellowship there as well. And I was actually telling Dr. Fowler before um, we started, I saw the, the other cardiology highlight that highlighted Dr. Celestio. She was actually one of my clinic attendings when I was in Dallas. And so she was actually one of my favorite people during my training program because I would literally ask for her advice on everything, on whether to, to go into academia versus private practice. And she is just such an excellent physician, has been an excellent influence for me. So that bottom picture at the bottom middle, that's uh, my fellowship graduation. And so 
another story is not only did I fail the MCAT twice, I actually became a uh, chief resident as well as chief fellow. So that's really a, a comeback story. So no matter how many times you fail, as long as you keep your head down, do the work, you can accomplish anything. So after I finished with my fellowship, I actually went back to UTMB as faculty and I worked as a um, clinical professor there. I really, really enjoyed my time in academia. I was going back and forth about whether I wanted to go into private practice versus academia, but I ended up doing academia first. I love the environment mainly because I love mentoring students. I love kind of uh, showing them the best route to go and to get them to where they're, they're, uh, where they're going. And I love rounding with the teams. So it was a really good experience for me. And I felt like it was a, a really good time period for me to really develop myself clinically and kind of get the confidence that I needed as an attending. But currently um, I'm actually part of a multi-specialty private practice group called Kelsey Siebold. And um, I've been there for the past three to four years, and it's been an, an, an excellent experience. So, you know, George, I, uh, I did it the opposite. I did my first 23 years uh, in the privates of emergency medicine in Georgia, working for private hospitals, actually. Built an urgent care center, went through all that. And then at age 47, I retired and decided to do something nice and quiet. So I came to Parkland <laughs> Hospital. You know what, and that's exactly what I thought I wanted to do. But I think now looking back at it, I think I needed to do academics first, especially, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I was still in the realm of research. And, you know, I had giants of the field working with me, you know, colleagues that I could, you know, rely on and ask them tips for cases. So I think it really helped. Eventually, I do think I probably will retire and go back to academics because even now I still I still miss it for sure. You know, I have. I'm 60, I'll be 69 in November, 44 years of clinical practice, just got my tail handed to me in a busy, busy ER last night, but I'm surrounded by the smartest clinicians I've ever known. Mm. They're so darn smart. And you know, that helps, you know, you can always find the answer to something when you don't exactly. know, you know what I mean? And it pushes you to do better. You know, it, it makes, it makes you make sure that you're staying current in your field. And that's the best part that I liked. And George, Elena has just said, you don't look a day over 21. So there you are. Okay. So she just made my day. So I have not, seen <laughs> my, both, both of my kids, um, unfortunately are under the weather. So my wife and I had literally have not slept for a week and, and, and work has been kicking my tail as well. So if you look closely, I have some bags and stuff underneath here, but thank you for, for giving me that compliment. I'm going to use that for the rest of the day, actually. <laughs> so what's a day in the life of a Kelsey Seawold cardiologist? So I will say I am very blessed because Kelsey's setup is very, we have a lot of factors that are very similar to the academic setting. So if you talk to a lot of private practice cardiologists, they usually are seeing patients in the morning in the hospital. They round there, they take a break, go back to the clinic, probably mid morning, see patients in the clinic in the morning, as well as the afternoon. And then usually have to go back to the hospital in the evening if there's anything up, that, anything else that needs to be tied up. So it's a fairly long day. It's a lot of back and forth. And a lot of the times they're going to multiple facilities. With Kelsey, it's very similar to an academic setting where for four to five weeks, I am purely in the clinic, Monday to Friday, eight to five. So I can dedicate my time to just taking care of my clinic patients, um, which is you know the, the, the bread and butter of our practice, building rapport with my patients, being able to speak with them about their medical diagnoses and educating them. But then every... Uh, on that fifth or sixth week, we then do a whole week inpatient where we're purely in the hospital. So that is completely, completely dedicated to just being in the hospital. So no clinic at all. And you're just seeing patients in the hospital. Now that is a lot more rigorous. So in the clinic, I'm probably seeing anywhere between 20 to 22 patients per day. Um, it, it's a little fast paced, but it still allows me the time I need to talk to my patients and really get to know them. Versus, you know, inpatient, it's a lot more grueling because these patients are a lot more sick. And so the days can be very unpredictable. I think at the height of COVID, I had the highest record. I think I saw about 32 patients in one day in the hospital. So it, you know, it can get really busy. The part that kind of the academic setting is, you know, we're loosely affiliated with the cardiovascular fellowship. So I'm still able to teach fellows. I have residents that, that round and follow, follow with me as well, too. So it's a really good mix where I have the autonomy of a private practice physician, but I'm still able to have that education side and giving back and mentoring um, with, with the fellows, the residents, as well as the medical students as well. So it's an excellent mix. And I think this is kind of the perfect fusion of what I was missing prior. Now, 
In the hospital, I will say it gets very, very, very busy. Um, the day is very unpredictable. So, I mean, I can get Paige to go do an urgent um, cardioversion, which essentially is shocking a patient's heart who's having an abnormal heart rhythm that's unstable, which I'm sure Dr. Fowler has to do quite a bit. Um, I might get Paige to the ER of a patient who's coming in having a heart attack. Um, I might get Paige to do a transesophageal echocardiogram, which is a ultrasound of the heart that we do, but we actually put a camera down the patient's feeding tube and take pictures of the heart. So the day is nonstop. So you're seeing patients, you're doing procedures and you're really firing off at all cylinders. Um, it can take a toll on you if you don't pace yourself, but honestly, the patients are what feeds you your energy and they, 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 they keep you coming back for more. So this is just kind of a, a couple of patients that I've seen that have kind of left an impact on me. And I think, I always think about how I would feel as a patient, you know, going to the ER, feeling horrible, and then a, a physician essentially fixing me up within five to 10 minutes and being amazed with that experience. Now I'm on the opposite spectrum of things where I'm the one doing that, but now I'm amazed because I see these patients in the hospital and they look like they're literally on death's door. They have a breathing tube in, a feeding tube, they have lines everywhere. And then they walk into my office four to six later, you know, four to six weeks later, and they're telling me, you know, like this guy in the top left, you know, he had a heart attack right before his daughter's wedding. He was able to walk her down the aisle. The guy at the bottom uh, bottom left was able to take his grandson to his first baseball game. So you have these awesome patients that come back and tell you how much you've impacted their life. And, you know, just with being with Kelsey in the past three to four years, you really get to know your patients and their families. I legit have one family where I'm seeing the husband, the wife, their adult, their adult daughter, their son-in-law, the son-in-law's mom, and I don't know how this happened, but I'm also seeing their realtor as well too. So you literally become a part of the family. And this family atmosphere, that's what keeps you going. So funny story is this, this very nice elderly lady that's there in the middle. This is actually my first year as an attending as, as, uh, at UTMB. And I was having the worst day. I just felt like I wasn't doing anything right. Um, you know, I, I was, I was running behind. I just felt like I wasn't really in the right place at the right time and doing what I was supposed to do. This awesome lady comes in, she prays for me and we're just talking. And then the lady over to the right is her daughter. And immediately I recognized her. She was actually one of the chaperones from that choir. I was telling you guys about the Fort Bend Boys Choir. She actually chaperoned me in that choir. So to have this woman who was involved of dragging me out of my shell, helping me develop this personality even become a doctor that then now having this full circle moment of me taking care of her mom so this is probably one of the best and most memorable experiences I've ever had with patients but it's these memories and these experiences this is what you need to hold on to to get you to those days so throughout the pandemic you know one thing that I've learned is I love to communicate with my patients so a lot of the times especially as a cardiologist I think the, the stereotype is that we're very surgically minded, meaning we don't like talking to patients. We try to do our patient encounters as quick as possible, but I am the exact opposite. If you cannot tell, <laughs> I used to be shy, but I talk a lot now. And I try to make sure that I leave every patient more educated and so that they can understand exactly what's going on with their medical diagnoses. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a patient and, you know, they'll come and they say, you know, I, I, I did whatever my doctor told me to do. I'm not sure what's going on. Or they don't really know their, their diagnoses. They don't know what medications they're taking. And it's like a lot of the times it's because no one's actually taking the time to really sit down and explain everything. So if you ask my patients, I literally sit, I draw pictures, I show diagrams, because I want every patient to understand exactly what's going on with them so that they can take an active role in their healthcare. And I think when you empower patients to do that, you increase the, you, you, you empower them and their compliant level goes up through the roof. So then they understand why they need to take their medications. They understand why they need to exercise. They understand why they need to eat healthy. So I really try to take my time and communicate. And luckily I've been in the right place at the right time since my time at Kelsey, where I've been able to do this, um, you know, through mass communication as well too. So I've been featured on the news several times, luckily, um, I've done a couple of uh, off-ed pieces and had some magazine articles as well. Um, I've been able to talk at, um, at healthcare conventions. Um, and then around the pandemic, I don't know, and I'm sure I can kind of speak for everybody. As a medical physician, I was so frustrated with the amount of misinformation and the amount of confusing communication that was going on. 
And I'm sure like most of you, I had family members and friends that would call me and DM me and text me asking questions about what was going on. And I knew if me as a physician, if I was watching the news confused about what was going on, I knew the general public was also confused as well too. And sure enough, my Instagram would just light up with these questions that, you know, as a cardiologist, I really wasn't equipped to answer. And so, you know, having most of my friends are physicians in different fields, ER and infectious disease and OB-GYN. So I got all my friends together and I actually created this IG live series that I entitled COVID Conversations. And we would just pick a topic um, kind of uh, dispel certain myths and talk about patients' concerns. And I really liked connecting with the community, especially our communities of color who are being disproportionately affected by COVID. This was a really good way to engage them and to get them the information that they needed in a concise manner. And I'm really happy to announce that I've had several people who have watched this series, you know, then come back and follow up that, hey, I got the vaccine purely because I watched your talk last week or I was able to get my mom vaccinated because I showed her your talk last week. So this is something that uh, a passion of mine that I hope I'm gonna develop throughout my medical career as well. So George, I'm gonna take a point that you've made that's so yes, very, sir. very, very, very important. I uh, worked a busy shift last night. I had two pre-med students with me. You know, we were getting slammed in the emergency department. And yet I go in the room, I sit on the bed, I hold old Aunt Minnie's hand and we talk. and. I have to say that after all these years, pushing 70, old man, that the most connected I feel in my professional life is looking in the eyes of somebody who is sick and terrified and confused and being able to, number one, reassure or assure them <clears throat> that, number one, we're going to make them feel better, but that, number two, we care about them. Mm -hmm. because the, the extension of the sense of caring is why we're here. And yet, how often do we see people go rushing past the patients? You know, the, the push to move people so fast, you, you're, you're typing on the computer while they're in the room with you, your back is to the patient, and you're not communicating. So I, I just love what you said, because that is the future of medicine, even in this scientific, connected, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence uh, electronic medical record era, don't you think? 100%. And I have to tell you, the, you know, my, my medical staff, they laugh at me because I get a lot of, you know, even though I've been there for three years, I still get a lot of new patients that are switching from other providers outside of Kelsey. And the number one reason is because they had a horrible bedside manner. They didn't talk to me. They didn't look at me in the eye. They didn't make me feel like my time mattered or that my health mattered. And that's something that I've experienced myself, you know, in medical school, um, I had an, I developed an ulcer because I was just stressing myself out beyond. And I went to go see a physician and not only, it, the, the bad experience kind of started as soon as I got there. I waited for about an hour and a half to get seen. And I didn't tell them I was a medical student. I just tried to be as compliant as possible, but I waited an hour and a half. Once I got in there, he probably spent about 10 minutes in the room with me, never looked at me in the eye, never shook my hand, never really explained to me what was going on. So if that can happen to me, you know, a medical student and now a physician, I can only imagine what the general public is going through. And I think it is going to be a struggle for you all because you guys are the future. And as, as you know, you know, medical or electronic medical records, it's a blessing and it's a curse. Um, it's, it, it helps you become efficient, but there is a little bit of a disconnect. I know I've seen physicians just straight up turn their backs to patients and type their notes without even looking. And so every, every time I have a medical student or a resident shadowing me, I make it a point. If you are going to type, because I know if you're like me, I mean, I have, I ha I'm having boomer moments now, even though I'm only 38. So I used to be able to write on my notes at the end of the day, but I need to jot something down so I know what's going on. I always tell them, you know what, turn the chair the, the, so that you can see the patient, connect with them, type, make sure you're pausing give them that eye contact, reassure them, make sure. And then at the end of the visit for at least 10 minutes, I literally push the computer away and I sit in front of them directly. And I say, hey, what questions or concerns do you have for me? And I make sure that we at least connect to that level. Just doing these small things, I think, really kind of um, differentiates between, between having good medical care and providing excellent medical care. So I think that's going to be a challenge for this new generation with all of the technology and everything that we have is being able to still be able to use this technology, but making sure you're connecting with the patients 100%. There, there are going to be so many challenges, including 
uh, one of our Nobel laureates here, uh, Bruce Beutler, who discovered that tumor necrosis factor alpha is what actually activates the immune system in sepsis for which he won the Nobel Prize, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, announced um, an article about him a couple of weeks ago. He's a geneticist mm -hmm. and he found, he has found at least 120 chromosomes uh, chromosome markers directly involved with the immune system. And he thinks there are thousands more. Now, what that translates to 10, 20 years from now, when these kids that are listening tonight <clears throat> uh, are, are working, is going to be all the new chemicals and all the new drugs affecting care in ways that we, we don't even know yet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so technology is on the forefront. Uh, and if I, I, forgive me for talking so much, George. And then one mm -hmm. last point is that I'm an EMS guy. I'm a pre-hospital guy. <clears throat> and our connectedness via telemedicine is coming by leaps and bounds. For example, smartwatch monitoring for arrhythmias, mm -hmm. which will be feeding into some kind of telemedicine, for example, to 911. If a smartwatch suddenly picks up ventricular fibrillation, that it immediately contacts 911 and they send an ambulance, for mm -hmm. example. So all that's coming. 100%. And I think we just have to make sure we take, of course, take the good with the bad, but making sure the, the, the center of patient care is that patient connection. So we have to make sure that we preserve that at all costs if possible. So before we go into the cases, I just want to briefly talk about work-life balance. So this is a picture of me and my family. I have a three-year-old daughter and a Tasmanian devil of a son. Um, this is when he was first born, but he's actually nine months now. Um, and I have to say, you know, I, I think the ACGME, which is kind of the accredit accreditation um, um, system with uh, residencies, they started kind of having rules in regards to like work hour regulations and stipulations right in the middle of my training. So I'm kind of that weird generation where we have some of that old school thinking of, you know, you just work yourself until the work is finished. Versus now, you know, also being introduced to making sure you have a work-life balance, making sure that you're taking care of your mental health. So I've always kind of felt a weird dichotomy and kind of stuck in the middle. And I will say, I don't think this gets talked about enough, but I do hope this new generation of, of medical providers that this is something that's in the forefront. And unfortunately, you know, I had to learn the hard way. I think with me, especially starting in academics, I had a little bit of imposter syndrome. And so despite being, you know, chief resident, chief fellow, I had done uh, multiple research projects. Um, I felt like my success wasn't deserved. And in a way, I felt like I had to continuously to prove myself. And one of the ways I did that is I tried to prove that I was how much of a hard worker I was. So my first year of practicing, I worked myself to the ground. Um, if anyone was sick, I always volunteered to take their call. Um, there was no limit to how many patients they would put on my schedule. If a patient needed something, I added them on without seeing, you know, the feasibility of it. And I was literally just working crazy hours. I would get to clinic an hour to an hour and a half before my first patient and probably stay an hour to an hour and a half after. It got to the point where, you know, I was literally nodding, um, falling asleep, driving home on several occasions and nearly had multiple accidents. And I think the, the, uh, the second thing is, you know, I would be so exhausted. I wouldn't take any time off. I would work on the weekends. I, I remember I went through like a four day stretch where I pretty much drank coffee with breakfast, lunch, and dinner just to keep myself awake. And I ended up dehydrating myself, nearly passing out and ending up in the ER. Um, so I, I think it's really important to make sure you keep that in the back of your mind. For me, I don't think I really changed my method of thinking until my daughter was born. So she was, she was due on a Thursday. So I told myself in my mind, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take a half day Thursday, depending on when she's born, take off Friday. And in my mind, I was like, I'm going to come back to work on Monday. And I thought that was normal. And I thought that was what I was supposed to do, but it wasn't until she was born. And I kind of had this, this, this shift in my thinking. I was like, you know, I, I can't do this. No one's going to be on their deathbed and, and wish that they had they had seen five to 10 more patients in clinic. They're gonna want more time with their loved ones. And I think work-life balance gets pushed on women a little bit more, um, mainly because, you know, starting a family and that kind of intersection between growing your career, but then also wanting to start a family. But I don't think um, men necessarily speak up 
more with this as well too. And for me, I'm starting to realize that, yeah, you know, my wife, she's a, she's a, a full-time, she works outside the home and she's a full-time mom on top of that. But despite that, even though I know she's, you know, going to do the grunt work of the parenting, I also want to be a part of that. I want to be there for their first steps. I want to be there when they're, when they're say their first word. And I think that's really important that you have to make kind of allowances within your schedule and your goals so that you can fit your, your work-life balance. I think I always assume that I could not be a dedicated physician and be a dedicated father. And I know that sounds crazy, but that doesn't really get taught with us. We kind of get taught to, you know, it's career, you're a physician, this is your life, you're in the medical field, this is what you're supposed to do. But I'm just now kind of learning how to, you know, create boundaries, making sure that I'm time efficient at work so that I can be present at home. And so kind of things that I do, I at least once or twice throughout the week, I make sure I'm out of clinic at a certain time so I can pick my kids up from daycare. And even if it's just us, you know, going to get ice cream or going to get candy or even just driving around singing songs in the car, I want to make sure that I have that one on one time because they're only going to be this young for a very short period of time. So I think work life balance is something everybody needs to um, um, keep in the back of your minds. And I hope this new generation that this is something that we're going to make a priority for sure. been a great session so far. We do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, but sure. before that, there have been a couple of comments from the students who have been really loving your presentation. I appreciate that. A lot of people really appreciated your talk on diversity. And one person even said that you're a great storyteller, which I absolutely agree with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so for a couple of questions, one of the questions that uh, students really want to know, how can they find a mentor, especially with the situation with COVID? A lot of shadowing programs are still closed. Do you have any advice for students who are trying to find someone to guide them through their path? So I think one is I always start with my local network. So family, friends, whoever you think you know, your physicians that you go to. So your pediatrician, your family medicine doctors, you'd be surprised the network of who knows who. And, you know, everyone's separated by a certain degrees. Right. So they can also help you as well. Surprisingly, during the, the pandemic, though, I've had multiple people just even contact me through social media. So I'm, I'm mentoring probably like 20 people right now who literally just reached out to social media. And, you know, it's not as effective when you're mentoring a lot, but at least it's something where they have a question about, you know, hey, I have a big decision I need to make. Can you help me with this? Or what do you think about this? So you'd be surprised. I think a lot of the physicians, especially the younger generation who are on Facebook, who are on Instagram, they're actually pretty receptive to talking to people just in the DMs and just like that. So I would also recommend trying that as well, too. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, another question uh, that has been really popular is, what's your advice for students that are dealing with sort of similar issues with the MCAT where they're not doing so well? Like, cause you, I know that you really turned around your score with that third time that you took it. Can you give the students any tips on how to maybe do that? I think one is you need, I, for, for one, I did not do, I, I didn't use any MCAT studying resources the first time. I just kind of bought a book, studied and thought I was doing well. I think doing an MCAT review class is paramount. They teach you certain tips, certain tricks, things that you wouldn't think of. And I actually did that on my third attempt, which really, which really helped. If you're someone who is not good at standardized um, tests, I also think it's important to maybe even talk to, you know, like your school psychologist or a diagnostician, and they can also help you with um, certain um, tips and tricks as well too. But then also, try to sit back and analyze what you're doing wrong. So don't do the same approach each time. You really need to kind of analyze what you're, what's going wrong and then fix that area and then attack it again. I think for me, you know, I took it back to back because I just thought it was a fluke. I think I probably needed to take some time back, reassess and then attack it again. So I definitely recommend doing that. Uh, Rohit, let me interject there. Um, <clears throat> there's sort of two types of the brain, two parts of the brain, the left brain and the right brain standardized tests are kind of a left brain logical sort of test, mm -hmm. whereas the day-to-day -day work of getting in there, work ethic, working hard, making grades is more of a right brain, artsy fartsy kind of thing. And um, I have found on the admissions committee, the 10 years that I've been on the committee, that people tend to do generally about the same on standardized tests. And so the overall score, if you made a B, so to speak, on SAT, you tend to make the same kind of score because your logical functions are similar. You can improve it somewhat, but look at your SAT score to give you some guidance about how you're gonna do on the MCAT. 
And I would also say, don't, don't be defeated. So, you know, my friends are probably going to kill me for saying this, but a couple of my friends in medical school, we all knew that each other did well on the, on the MCAT, but we were so embarrassed to tell each other our scores. And at the end of medical school, we wrote them down and showed each other. And it was about five of us. And I mean, these scores were horrible. And all five of us, our attendings, your chief, all of us actually became um, chief residents and we're all doing the work. So a standardized test score is not a summation of who you are as a person, how hard you can work or how much success you're gonna have. So don't be defeated at all. Thanks to you both for the advice. Uh, another question that, patient, uh, that students have is, how do you handle uh, non-compliant patients or patients that are rude and disrespectful in a way that you, st you still can get across to them to successfully? You know, what's funny is, and I actually had this happen to me last week. Um, I had a, a, a elder, elderly gentleman who came in um, and I, I had, was already reading his chart and everyone said he was very difficult and kind of had some racial undertones that were not appreciated. So I knew going off, I'm like, he, this is probably not gonna go well. And I could tell the whole time he was trying to insult me or bait me. And I literally, I just kept on being kind and I kind of kept on asking my questions. And by the end of the visit, we literally were laughing about an old TV show. I think MacGyver or something like that. So my philosophy is I always try to kill people with kindness. There is no point in getting upset, getting offended. Um, I've, had, I've had some physicians, I mean, get so upset that they've had to leave the room. But it's like at the end of that encounter, is that patient any less of a bad person? And are you any less offended? So essentially you really did not do anything. I, my philosophy, I always kill them with kindness and that I've, I've, in, my, in my circumstances, that has always been the way. And then I over communicate. So patients who are non-compliant, I make sure that they understand what's going on and they understand the risk. You know, you can only lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. So at the end of the day, if they're equipped with that knowledge and that information, they still choose not to take the advice and that's on them. And I feel comfortable knowing that I did everything that I possibly could have. Thank you for telling us. I'll just ask one more uh, question for now. How do you deal with burnout, especially if you don't have as much downtime with your schedule? So burnout is something that's very real. And I think it's and I, I would definitely love to hear from Dr. Fowler after this as well, too, with the, his, the length of time that he's practiced. But it's crazy. I, I don't know if this is a generational thing, but a lot of the younger physicians, you know, even people that I've helped, um, you know, get them through fellowship and they're in their second or third year practicing. I feel like some of them are already experiencing burnout. Um, as you know, it's a long road to become a physician. So for cardiologists, it's four years of college, um, um, four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine residency, and then three years of cardiology fellowship. And plus I had a gap year as well too, getting my master's of public health. So that is a long time to essentially be in a school-like environment and to be training and to be sleep deprived. But I think with me is I always try to maintain that balance. Um, even if it's something small, like we were just saying, Dr. Fowler was saying about, you know, finding an activity that you like. So I like singing. So throughout medical school and residency, I was always in some type of choir or something outside of medicine. Now that I'm an attending, um, I think, again, that first year I had imposter syndrome, I, I didn't take vacation for um, up until my daughter was born. But now I try to regularly take, even if it's just a half day to just get your mind off of doing something not medicine related. The other thing is I try to be as time efficient as possible. So I get up usually around 4.45 in the morning. I get a workout in. That's my private time. The kids are still asleep. My wife is usually asleep. That's my private time to be able to kind of refocus, meditate, and get prepared for the day. Um, and so I think finding those little things will definitely help. Um, as much as possible, it's cliche, but try to get as much sleep as possible. And you have to realize that in order for you to be effective for your patients, you need to be performing at your best. So you have to make sure you're taking care of yourself at the end of the day. Um, Rohit, I would come, George, that's just wonderful. I, and what you did was that you described an infrastructure, for example, having your own personal time, working out, et cetera. You described an infrastructure that supports then what I would add to that is, um, it is very important that you enjoy what you do. Burnout is the symptom of not enjoying what you do. Um, and thus, if you find issues and places where you can make a difference and a change and it improves your enjoyment, then take an active stand. Uh, I've been a doc for a long time. 
you know, and y'all have heard me say this before, but folks, you're going to get into medicine. Guess what? You're getting into a business where you cannot be wrong. Mm -hmm. You Now you're going to be wrong from time to time, but you can't accept the fact that you're going to be wrong going into a patient. You have to make the right decision. So there I am in the middle of a busy ER, seven hours in. I'm an old man. I'm tired. My ears ring. And I've got, you know, nurses and techs and secretaries just talking so loud at the nurse's station. And it just makes me so mad and irritable. I'm over here making life and death decisions. And they're talking about what they're going to be doing about getting a drink after work and who they're going to go hang with. And it makes me mad. Well, that is what causes burnout is that you don't enjoy what you do. So what's the right thing to do? You yell at the people? No, it doesn't work. What do you do instead is let us work together in a policy in which what we're trying to do is focus our time and our energy on making safe and accurate, accurate decisions. Don't we all agree on that? Something mm -hmm. like that. And, and there are many other areas, George, I know you've got a dozen in which there were things that you could fix, you would fix if you could, but taking a proactive stance on trying to um, improve conditions so that you continue to enjoy what you do. And I think also to make sure that you're not, you're not scared or worried for change. You know, I, I actually mentor uh, a young lady who went into cardiology. She did about a year and a half of the fellowship and she absolutely hated it. And, you know, her whole life, she thought she wanted to be a cardiologist. She had shadowed people before she had done programs, but she, when it came down to it, she was not enjoying herself. And I kept on, you know, every time we would meet, I'm like, you look miserable. You're like, you're not, you don't even look like yourself. And she finally told me she, she literally had anxiety getting up and going to work. She hated cardiology and she, but she was prepared to go through all three years just so she could graduate. And I finally had to tell her, like, if you're unhappy now, do you think this is going to get any better? Do you really want to stay in a field that you're not unhappy in? So I think a lot of us in medicine, we're very type A. We make decisions, we roll with them and we're very organized and planned and we want things a certain way but you know what the, the path to becoming a physician and definitely the path to be happy is not a straight one it's definitely windy there's bumps and roads so you have to make all the necessary adjustments and change and make sure you're flexible thank you for sharing why don't we move on to the second half of your presentation sure so I have included um, two cases here that I saw relatively um, recently and I think with cardiology, most people actually, you know, I, I'll just call my brother out. My brother just says, as a, cardi as a cardiologist, all I do is listen to people talk about chest pain. So I picked two very, very different case presentations um, of chest pain um, that I, I found very interesting. So the first I kind of entitled CrossFit Chaos. So this is a 38 year old healthy white male who presented to the ER with chest pain. He initially noticed it after working um, increased hours at work. So he was a bartender, was working two to three hours shift, two to three, um, I'm sorry, double shifts, and thought he was just overworking himself, but he just started noticing he was having chest pain located in the center of his chest that radiated down to his left arm. His associated symptoms included nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath, and fatigue. He still continued to exercise. Um, and, you know, despite the, the, the pain getting worse, he did notice that the, the pain seemed to get worse with exercise and definitely got better with rest. And the week prior to going to the hospital, he felt like the severity went up from about a four out of 10 to about a nine out of 10. While he was at CrossFit with his fiance, he experienced severe chest pain that caused him to fall to the ground, clutching his chest. Um, EMS was called and he was actually transported to the ER. And funny story, because Dr. Fowler was just talking about a study about the percentage of patients with uh, having a heart attack who come to the ER by car. He's definitely one of them. He did not want to go to the ER. And essentially, his fiance had to threaten him in order to get him uh, in the ambulance. So his past medical history really was only for obesity. Um, they were getting ready for their wedding. So he had recently lost about 50 pounds doing the keto diet. But other than that, he had no other, um, no other issues at all that were diagnosed. He did not know his family history because he was estranged from his family. So his family history, unfortunately, was unknown. His social history, like I stated before, he worked as a bartender. Um, at baseline, he worked out about three to four times a week. He was a social drinker and just only admitted to using marijuana use occasionally, but no cocaine or methamphetamines or any other, or any other drugs of that nature. 
on exam, he was hypertensive. So his blood pressure was elevated. It was 151 over 90 over 90. His heart rate, he was tachycardic or had a, a, a fast heart rate um, at 100. And his respiratory rate, he was breathing at an increased, uh, um, increased rate as well too at 20. And so one of the things that she'll get used to, you know, being a, uh, uh, being a healthcare provider is we kind of call it the eyeball test. And that's looking at a patient and kind of seeing, are they acutely ill? Are they in distress? Are they uncomfortable? And you'll be surprised how diagnostic that, that is. So that's one of the very first things I noticed. He looked uncomfortable. He was diaphoretic, which is just a fancy term for he, that he was sweating. Uh, but other, other than that, his physical examination for the most part was unremarkable. So we advanced to getting his labs. He had a lipid panel, a total cholesterol of 297, which is elevated. We ideally, especially for his age, that should be well below 200. He had slightly increased triglycerides. He had a low HDL, which is your good cholesterol. So he had low good cholesterol. And his LDL, which is his bad cholesterol, was severely elevated, which is 200. We checked a, a, a lab value called troponin, and essentially, it is a lab value that tells us if the patient is having any kind of current or acute cardiac injury. So a normal value is less than 0.04 and he had a troponin of 22. So it's severely abnormal. We ended up getting an EKG on him and EKG essentially looks at the electrical activity of the heart. And if you can see at the top here, I kind of, you know, for those who haven't seen a lot of EKGs, this is what a normal should look like. So it should have a P wave. And this is just evidence that the top chambers of the heart or the atria um, are beating. And then the, this big uh, wave here is a QRS. And that's, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, this is the bottom chambers of the heart beating. And then the T wave, which is repolarization and everything kind of going back to normal. What we really pay attention to um, is this ST segment here. This gives us a lot of information if there's any active um, heart issues going on. If this line is depressed or slugging or, or, or kind of pointing down, that's evidence of what we call myocardial ischemia or decreased blood flow to the heart muscle. If it's elevated like this, that's telling us that not only is there decreased blood flow, but there's actually um, active muscle death that's occurring. So if you can see here, this is his EKG and you can see a lot of S, what we call ST elevation. So this is an EKG signs of a heart attack or what we call ST elevation myocardial infusion or for short STEMI. So 38 year old gentleman coming in, otherwise healthy, high cholesterol panel, elevated troponin, now having signs of a heart attack. So the next step in these patients is to take them straight to the cath lab and to do a coronary angiogram. So your aorta, which is this big artery here, this is the powerhouse um, in regards to delivering oxygenated blood to all of your organs. So all of your arteries branch off this aorta and, and they are um, assigned to a particular origin or, uh, organ or tissue and deliver oxygen rich blood. So that means all arteries point back to the heart. So an uh, uh, angiogram, we can actually take a catheter and go in either through the arteries of the wrist or the artery, the femoral artery here through the growing and thread a catheter all the way up into the aorta and we come back into the aorta and then we can then put it in the, in the coronary arteries. And these are the arteries that actually feed the heart muscle itself. And these are what are diseased if you're having a heart attack. So that's that, what's this picture here? This is the, the cath that we use, the guide cath. It goes into this artery here. We then shoot dye into the artery and we take a continuous kind of like an x-ray to let us know if there's any heart blockages that are going on. So before we show that, you know, just kind of a general overview of the heart arteries. The heart has kind of two um, blood supply. Uh, on the left, this uh, first portion here that comes off of the aorta is called the left main. It then splits off into the LAD, which kind of does the majority of the blood supply of the, of the, the, of the, the ventricle, which is the, the pumping chamber here. And then you have the left circumflex, which just, just kind of does the side portion of the heart. And then you have on the right side, you have your right coronary artery, which supplies the inferior and the right portions of the heart here. So when you have an angiogram, this is that guide catheter I was showing you guys before. And this is what a right coronary artery should look like. You see it's nice and plump, it's nice and juicy, and you really don't see that many um, abnormalities at all. So this is a video of my patient. So the right is what normal is, and I want you to compare it to that. And this is what his looked like. So again, you see the catheter here into the artery. You have good blood flow on the port, the, the proximal or this 
early portion of the artery, and then all of a sudden there's a stump here and there's no blood flow going down here. So he has an acute obstruction and he was actively having a heart attack. So because of that blockage, he ended up getting a stent placed to that area of his heart. So it allows us to go in, suck that, that, that thrombus or that blood clot that's there, clean up all that gunk that's there. And then we put a stent in to keep that area open. He recovered barely, very well in the hospital, especially given his age. I actually saw him in the office about four to six weeks later. He actually returned doing CrossFit, um, was working out with no issues at all. He had no further chest pain and kind of felt back to his normal. His fiance came with him and she said he actually started keto because he was unable to lose weight the conventional way. And he was really trying to get, you know, 50 to 100 pounds off before their wedding. But she said his keto had gone bad. So instead of eating healthy fats, avocados and nuts, he actually, she had, on multiple occasions, she said she had actually caught him drinking straight up bacon grease, going through multiple sticks of butter per day. And he was eating fried chicken several times a day. So he thought that as long as he was eating fat, he would keep his keto diet up and would continue to lose the weight. And so this drinking bacon juice, I, I actually thought that was a joke, but if you go on, if you go on YouTube, this is a whole thing. And if you see this guy down here, he said, why did I agree to do this? This is not a good thing at all. So when you are a physician, part of our job is to kind of be an investigator or at least try to figure out if we can place the pieces of the patient's puzzle together, figure out which pieces do fit together. And those that don't, we have to kind of ask ourselves why. So the pieces that didn't fit to me or that stood out or that were red flags was he was very young. So males usually don't have heart attacks before the age of 55. Anything above that is usually premature. And for women, it's usually around 60 or 65. So in late 30s is a very, very early, very, very early heart attack. On top of that, otherwise, he was in excellent shape. He was doing CrossFit. He was losing weight. He looked great. For his age, as we talked about before, his cholesterol levels were severely elevated. And despite his cholesterol, he really didn't have any other risk factors to have a heart attack. His blood pressure prior to this episode was normal. He was not a smoker. He did not have diabetes. But unfortunately, because of his, him being estranged from his family, we did not know his family history. So we didn't know if there may have been a genetic component. So the top two things that kind of popped in my head was one, does he have familial hyper, um, hyperlipidemia? And is his keto diet possibly contributing to his heart blockages? So I just want to briefly talk about familial hyperlipidemia is a genetic mutation where your body kind of metabolizes cholesterol differently. And so it causes severely elevated cholesterol levels at a very, very early age. So the American Heart Association, actually the criteria is to have an LDL greater than 190 and or having a first degree relative with an LDL, LDL above 190 and also having premature heart disease. Unfortunately, most of these patients, we catch them on accident. So it's during a, 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 a health screen where we're just checking their cho uh, cholesterol levels, or like our patient, it's after they've had a cardiac event. Unless you have a severe mutation, most of these go you know, undiagnosed. In those that have um, severe mutations, they have some of these clinical um, physical manifestations where they can actually have cholesterol accumulations in their joints and in their tendons. Um, they can have collections around their eyes and they can actually develop this kind of gray or hazy looking thing around their cornea as well too. But again, if you have a very minor or um, not as common mutation, a lot of these people end up being undiagnosed for a long time until it's too late. Because it is genetic, we always recommend that patients um, have their first degree relative screened and of course, the goal of treatment is to get them, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to get their LDL levels lower and decrease their chances of them having uh, coronary artery disease in the future. <coughs> excuse me. So the other thing that really bothered me was, was his keto diet also contributing to his heart disease? So just a little background on keto diet. It's actually not as new as everyone thinks it is. It's actually been around going back to the 1920s. And doctors back then actually used to use the keto diet to treat epilepsy. And it was thought that the accumulation of ketones in the blood actually worked as an anticonvulsant. So the keto diet is not new at all. It's just gained popularity recently because, you know, celebrities like Kim Kardashian, LeBron James have all used it to cut weight. Essentially, this diet is compromised of having a high fat, 
moderate protein, but very, very, very low carb diet. And essentially our bodies are programmed to use glucose or sugar as our fuel for energy. But in the keto diet, because you're inject, you're ingesting all of this high fat, you're retraining your body to actually use fat as its preferred fuel. And so it depletes your fat storages and which is why people tend to lose weight quite a bit. People ask me all the time, is the keto diet bad for my heart? And honestly, right now, we really don't know because there's no long-term, large, randomized controlled trials that have looked at this exclusively. So I think that has to happen first before we can say definitively. What we do know though, is that of course, losing weight with the keto diet can decrease the chances of you developing diabetes. Um, it decreases your BMI. It can decrease the chance of you having hypertension. So in those instances, those might possibly um, help to prevent heart disease. But if you're like my patient and you're eating, you know, drinking bacon grease, you know, that can actually go the other way. So in most patients who are doing keto, I always recommend one, make sure you're telling your physician, get a baseline cholesterol panel prior to starting, and then get one intermittently while you're first starting it. What I've, been, you know, and I've kind of have just been tracking this independently, but in most of my patients who are doing keto the healthy way, I tend to see that they have an acute or sudden increase in their bad cholesterol in the beginning. Then it usually tapers off and decreases. And then I see a jump in their good cholesterol. But again, that's if you're doing keto the right way and the healthy way. As we know, not all fats are created equally. So of course, the patient that's eating uh, avocados and walnuts and salmon, they're going to have a fairly good cholesterol panel versus someone who's drinking bacon grease. So it's really, really important to know that all fats are not created equally and those saturated fats will still increase your bad cholesterol. So I, I never... I never tell patients not to do keto, but I always make sure that I caution them and make sure that they're under um, the monitoring of a physician. Any, any questions about this case before we move on? You saved that guy's life. I tried to, and you know what's crazy is I feel like there has been a, he kind of opened the gateway. I just started talking to different colleagues of mine and we all have stories very similar to this. It's young, healthy patients, no past medical history, but they're doing keto incorrectly and they have a heart attack. So I'm actually thinking about writing this up as a paper because I think this is something as popular as this diet is, this is something that the general public needs to know. All righty. So we'll move on to my next case. Um, I entitled this one, <clears throat> Generation Dragon Ball Z. So this is a 21 year old male who presents to the ER with sudden chest pain located near the center of his chest and that radiated to his back. He described it as a tearing-like sensation um, and that was rated at about an eight out of 10, so it was pretty severe. Um, it occurred while he was playing Dragon Ball Z, hence the name, um, but he states he had no obvious triggers or any of the associated symptoms. And prior to this, he was fairly healthy, exercising, kind of living as a normal 21-year-old. <clears throat> so his mom stated that he had a surgery in his teens to correct an abnormal sternum. And they were excellent. They actually had pictures prior to him having his operation. So these pictures here at the bottom, this is what his sternum looked like prior. And as you can see, he has this pretty severe indentation right in the middle of his chest here. He then had surgery, um, I believe he said around age 16. It's hard to see in this picture. He still has some indentation, but it is definitely improved from what it was. But again, you know, I talked about the eyeball test, just looking at a patient and getting a baseline observation. And the first thing I noticed is that in the bed, I mean, he was literally the whole length of the bed. So he's a very tall guy. So I had him stand up. He was six, seven, very tall, very slender. And if you can see his arm span here, I mean, he had, his arm span was pretty impressive. But he did he have, guy. did he have very large hands? They were very <laughs> large. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So he's a current college student. Um, apparently he stated he had no medications, drugs, or alcohol. Although now that I'm realizing his mom was in the room when I asked him those questions. So that may not as be as accurate with him being a college student. Um, but on exam, his vitals, his EKG, and the remainder of his physical examination for the most part was unremarkable. So he ended up getting an, uh, an x-ray in the ER. And what they noted is that he had a very widened mediastinum. And so mediastinum pretty much is just a fancy term for all the stuff that's in between the lungs. So the lining of the heart, the heart itself, your aorta, 
um, your lymph nodes, anything that, you know, when they say a widening mediastinum, those should kind of be the top things on your differential in regards to having some type of abnormality. Because of his physical presentation, the type of chest pain he got, we then got a CAT scan of his chest. And if you can see here, this is his aorta that's here. And I'll show you some better pictures um, for more detail. The kind of, if you can kind of orient yourself, it's almost like he's standing to the side like this and the camera is taking pictures this way. So we kind of see a cross section of his heart and his aorta. What we want to see in a normal aorta is that the contrast that we give the I, via IV should fill this whole entire aorta and a nice even distribution. But as you can see, there's all these streaks here and this is consistent with aortic dissection or a tear in the aorta. And so your aorta, it looks like a candy cane in your body <laughs> and kind of think of it like a straw. So the lumen or the middle of the straw, that's where all the blood goes and all of your arteries branch off of this aorta and they then deliver blood flow to all of your different organs. So we kind of <clears throat> name it, this is the ascending aorta, the arch, which has blood vessels that feed the arms and the brain, most importantly, and then the descending aorta. And this actually branches all the way down to your abdomen. It splits off in two and actually goes down in your legs as well too. So this is the, in regards to distribution of blood, this is the showstopper here. So think of that straw. There's three, there's three kind of layers of, of tissue of that straw. The inside is called the intima. That's this area here. So this is the lumen here where blood is supposed to be. This is the intima. And then the media, which is kind of this muscular area here. And then the adventitia, which is that outer, outer layer. With an aortic dissection, you have a tear in that middle, in that inner lining um, that's right by the, the lumen or the middle of that straw. And so instead of blood going down evenly throughout the lumen of the aorta, it then starts to leak inside of, the, of these layers here. And it develops this like sac-like area here where you now have the actual lumen of the, the aorta, but then it develops a false lumen as well too. So one can kind of see if you have blood that's going into this false area here, that means it's not going to the organs that actually need this blood. So this can be um, a medical emergency. There's two different types of how we classify it. There's a type A aortic dissection, which usually um, involves this ascending or the aortic arch. And this is a surgical emergency because again, there's vessels here that go up to the neck and actually feed the brain. So you can imagine if the brain stops getting blood flow, that's, that can be a disaster. And essentially it's affecting everything else going downstream versus a type B aortic dissection, which is actually um, the, de the descending portion of the aorta. This can actually be treated medically and we can monitor these patients, but if it's a proximal or type A dissection, this is a surgical emergency. And <clears throat> rightfully so, I had to call the surgeons right away. So these are just other examples and I feel like they kind of give you a better idea of what we're dealing with. <clears throat> this here, this is supposed to be this kind of light gray. This is what the aorta inside that, that straw, this is the true lumen. So this is where blood should be going to get delivered to all the organs. But then you see this very dark area here, this is the false lumen. So you have blood flow that's going into this area here and it's, it can actually start to, to um, entrap the true lumen. And again, decrease blood flow going to vital organs which can wreak havoc and cause um, uh, systemic failure. This is another patient that I saw. So aortic dissections, we don't see that frequently. They're fairly rare, but I don't know what was going on. It was a full moon. And literally two weeks after I saw this young patient, I had an older patient come in with very similar symptoms. And this was his, uh, here we go. This was his CAT scan. And as you can see, it's a lot lower um, compared to our young patient here, but you can see there is a, a actual shearing of the aorta. There is a clear separation and a tear there. So this is a good example of a type B dissection. So type A being in this proximal portion and then type B being in the distal portion here. And this goes all the way down. So on the occasional one that goes all the way from a type A near the aortic valve, all the way down, how do you classify that? So <clears throat> they have, well, there's multiple different classifications. There's the DeBakey and there's the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and there's also type A and type B. Um, there is some, there's a mix or like a combo where you can be like type 1A and type 1B. And I believe that one is type 1B. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
So again, being a doctor, one of the things we have to do is we have to be, we have to make sure that the puzzle pieces fit together, but we also kind of have to be an investigator and figure out if there's anything else that's going on that we need to be worried about. So the things for him, again, he's a young guy. He had uh, some, some abnormalities of his, um, of, of his breastbone. So all of those things got me worried for Marfan syndrome. So Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder. And in regards to the heart, it can cause dilation of the aorta, dissection, which we just, which we just saw, and in severe cases can actually cause rupture and, and people can pass away from this. Usually the patients are tall and slender. Their arm span is longer than their height. So kind of similar to what our patient looked like. They have abnormalities of the chest, uh, of, of the breastbone here. So it can be you know, con concave as well as convex. And this is kind of similar to what our patient looked like prior to his surgery. <clears throat> they usually tend to have large, um, large hands as well as very long fingers. And so if you have them put their thumbs in their palm, you can usually see their thumb on the other side. You can, uh, their joints tend to be hypermobile as well. So if you ask them to put their, their thumb and their pinky together like this, usually you'll see a little bit of overlappage. I know it's kind of hard to see in this picture here. And our patient tested positive for all of this. Um, one of the most kind of, um, I guess, famous people that we, we suspect may have had Marfan syndrome is Abraham Lincoln. So I usually kind of have that body type in my brain whenever I'm worried about Marfan syndrome. There is criteria that you can um, check off the list to see if they meet seven or the above. And there's actually genetic testing you can get as well. Again, because this is genetic, first degree relatives do need to be screened for this as well too. Um, so in our patient, um, I haven't seen him in the office as of yet because this literally just happened three weeks ago. Um, but um, we're gonna do the Gantt criteria and I'm more than, more than confident that he does have Marfan syndrome. Um, he actually did very well. He was rushed off to surgery and he is recovering well at home. Um, and I hope to see him in the office soon. So I, will, I can give you guys an update on how he's doing. Um, but I thought this was one a very interesting case that kind of encapsulated multiple teaching points. And I think that is all of my cases I have for you guys. And I will give it back to Rohit. Thanks. Hey, um, George, um, yes, uh, I've been around so long. I, I've seen several dissections as I know you have. And I remember one that a guy came in uh, with acute crushing chest pain, radiating through to the back. Uh, this was a long time ago, back in the 80s. <clears throat> and uh, he had the enlarged mediastinum. He had unequal blood pressures in his extremities. I called the vascular surgeon on the phone. And in the process, the guy proceeds to have an acute MI. He then goes into cardiogenic shock, uh, presumably bleeding into the pericardium. And uh, the, the vascular surgeon said, he's about to die in front of you. And indeed, there wasn't a thing I could do because I would have had to mobilize him for a nearly hour ride into Atlanta. And we lost him. <clears throat> and then we had a very tall, slender fellow with enormous hands who was, a, who was a, a service person at our hospital. And he came in one day when I was on having crushing chest pain. He had a dissection and we sent him off to Emory for surgery, fully expecting we would never see him again because he was, he was in shock when he left. We, we were sure he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, months later, he came back to work. So sometimes the magic works. And, and, and kind of what to your point, so just to kind of go back here to what Dr. Bob was saying. <clears throat> so remember in our, our first patient here, sorry guys, let me go back all the way. So you know, your, your coronary arteries come off of the aorta here. So you can imagine if you have a dissection, sometimes it can go all the way down and even go into the coronaries as well. So not only are you having your organs not getting blood flow, but now when it's affecting the, the coronary arteries, you're now also having myocardial <clears throat> stimulus to the heart muscle itself. And so what Dr. Fowler is saying is sometimes, yeah, it can dissect all the way into the sac of the heart. So the, the sac that the heart actually sits in. And once that fills up with blood, if the pressure becomes so immense, the heart can't even relax to fill up with blood and then to, to, and to beat, which is called cardiac tamponade. So luckily we don't see that a lot. I think we're diagnosing these a lot sooner and we're able to kind of, our pediatricians are really good at diagnosing these patients with Marfan's a lot earlier as well too in the clinical course. Plus we have chest CTs ready, readily available and we do <laughs> CTs almost like water. Can you go forward a slide or two and show that cornea with the arcus? Uh, uh, yes, keep coming forward uh, there. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, one day you'll be looking at a patient and talking to them. And the question is, as a clinician, would you notice that there's a little hazy white ring around what's called the limbus of the cornea right there? It can be normal, but it also can be cholesterol being deposited. Now, the question is, will you be a sharp enough clinician like, uh, uh, like our uh, guest here this evening to be able to notice that this is actually indicative of a patient who very likely has high cholesterol and triglycerides? And you know what's crazy is, uh, you know, I, a lot of older patients, especially in the Nigerian community, have this. And in some people, you know, they think it's more of a fashion thing that it looks nice. And so I, you know, and, and up until I got into medical school, I, I didn't know that this is actually a sign of disease because people actually liked the way it looked. So this is a very important thing. And, and I think now that you've seen it, if you look at an older patient, you'll start to see this a lot more often. This is great stuff. Rohit, you got a few more questions for our guest? Uh, this is going great, George. We got plenty of time and let's just take two or three more questions and uh, sure. then wrap up. Sure. Uh, another question that uh, students have is, have you seen any correlations between COVID and heart issues in your practice? Or another mm -hmm. way of phrasing it would be, um, how many cases of heart related or COVID related heart issues have you seen? A lot. Um, and the problem with COVID is that you know, it wreaks havoc to the body. And as we know, it's not necessarily the virus itself that causes these manifestations, but it's the immune system's response to the virus that causes it. There's a lot of different manifestations. Some of the common ones that we see is, you know, young and healthy patients who go in, you know, I, so for example, I saw someone in the peak of the pandemic, she was 35, a marathon runner, completely healthy. She came in, she had COVID, um, developed double lung pneumonia and we really just was, was going down here very quickly. Her blood pressure started to drop. So she was in cardiogenic shock. We got an ultrasound of her heart and, you know, a normal pumping function, you should be able to pump about 55% of all the blood coming in out of your, out of your uh, heart. So that's what we call an ejection fraction. Her ejection fraction was in the teens. So this is a young and healthy patient. So it can cause heart failure. It can cause arrhythmias. So tachycardia, so elevated heart rates. We've seen patients where it causes inflammation of the, the sac that the heart sits in, as well as the heart muscle itself. I think that that myocarditis, which is the, the inflammation of the heart muscle itself, I think that's something that we're all kind of collectively afraid of because during the time that these, these college athletes were in the bubble and a lot of them got tested for COVID and they had to get cleared um, to come back from a cardiovascular standpoint. And a lot of them tested positive for having inflammation of the heart. Clinically, we don't know how significant that is. We don't know if that heart damage is permanent, but that is something that's being investigated. <clears throat> there are so many different manifestations that the COVID virus can do to the heart for sure. George, it's very interesting about what COVID is because, you know, I have read more about COVID of anything since medical school and probably <laughs> including medical school. And it's difficult to know what the disease actually is. For example, the National Institutes of Health this week put out a paper that mm -hmm. it says COVID apparently somehow uh, clips the cilia out of the respiratory uh, mm -hmm. uh, system and such that you can't cough stuff up. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, and what does that have to do with mucus remaining in the lungs because you can't cough it up? I think, though, this is just my and forgive me for blurting this out as an ignorant person, but I've been reading a lot about this. COVID appears to be an endotheliopathy. 100 percent. And that it appears to and for the for the students, this it appears to affect the lining of the blood vessels and also the lining of other tissue that has a lining and thus stimulating then inflammatory response, as George was saying. And so it's a very, very interesting disease. I would also, since you brought up COVID, um, the Delta variant appears to be at least twice as transmissible, but has, has a thousand percent higher uh, viral load in the body. And so this is a very weird, strange um, uh, uh, disease and please everybody take your vaccine. 100%. And I think, you know, we were, we were so optimistic because again, at the height of the, of the, of the pandemic, uh, probably 90% of every patient that I was consulted on had COVID. And then it went essentially to zero a couple of months ago, but now it's slowly creeping back up. 
And so I did my, my one week in the hospital about two weeks ago and about 30% of every patient that I saw had COVID. So like Dr. Fowler was saying, this, this, this Delta virus is something that we cannot mess with at all. We have to take it seriously. Thank you for letting us know. Another uh, question that uh, students are interested in, what's a cool fact about the harp that a lot of people outside of medicine don't really know? I mean, one, I think it's the coolest organ in the body. <laughs> so a friend of mine is who is a neurologist. We go back and forth about who has the better organ. Is it the brain that's really the control center or is it the heart? And of course, his, his argument is that, you know, the, the brain has to tell the heart to beat, but the, I think the heart is the coolest organ in our body. Um, there is just so much that we are learning um, about it every day, how it responds to stress. I think one of the, one of the things that I, I was interested in, that I read pretty early in my fellowship is how men and women respond different, cardiovascularly respond differently to stress. So women tend to have palpitations because their heart rate goes up in response to catecholamines and stress versus with men, we tend to have a more vascular type of response. And so our blood pressure goes up. And so I think about that in practice with women, the number one thing that I see as a, as a, a, a chief complaint is, is palpitations. And just anecdotally, you know, during the pandemic, you know, my, my wife gave birth to our son in the middle of the pandemic. So we were both severely stressed and at the height of it, my blood pressure started to slowly go up and she developed palpitations. So I think that's one of the coolest facts that I've learned. That's all the questions for me. Dr. Fowler, do you have any last few questions? George, what a wonderful presentation. We're so grateful. Uh, this is terrific. I'm glad that we talked about the evaluation of the patient at the bedside, the good old fashioned getting in the room, talking to the patient, taking an excellent history, and then performing a, a thorough, careful, targeted history, uh, physical, with evaluations for the purpose of being able to determine what's going on and then to be able to prescribe appropriately for the patients. This has just been a terrific presentation. All the, and George, you had over 300 students tonight listening to you and they were all just sitting on the edges of their chair. Uh, <clears throat> we find, we will post this talk, George, as you know, on our uh, virtual shadowing uh, site, which will be on YouTube. Yeah. And we typically have about 5,000 people over the next week or so that'll watch the talk each one of them, George, will become a medical provider down the road. Uh, each one of them will see 100,000 patients in their lifetime. Uh, 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. Wow. George, tonight, with your wonderful talk and your humanity and your sweet nature and your amazing skill, you've touched a half a billion lives, and we are very, very grateful. Would everybody online please put thank you into the chat right now? And George, take a look at the chat and watch this popping through because it's our special way of saying <laughs> thank you so very much. We're so very, that. very grateful. I love that. You guys literally just made my day. Um, again, I was a little bit nervous because you guys have had some excellent talks. So I hope I was able to give you guys some good insight um, and hopefully some advice to help you guys down the road. Um, I'm, but my information's there. I'm on Instagram literally probably every 30 minutes. So any questions or anything that I can do to help, definitely feel free to reach out. And I wish all of you luck. Again, congrats on this wonderful initiative. And I, I really am impressed and wish you all uh, nothing but the best. Thank you, George. Rohit, do you want to give us some info about the exam? Yeah, if you could go to the last slide. Sure. <clears throat> uh, one more, one more, George. Here we go. Here's the quiz information for this session. And here's the QR code, and we'll also post the link on our website, as well as in our weekly emails. As usual, you'll have until next session at 6.59 PM Central Standard Time to take the test. You have two attempts, and you have to score at least a 70% to get credit. <clears throat> All right, everybody. Uh, this is virtual shadowing, and we are here for you. If you keep coming back, we're going to be here. Uh, it's an absolute honor and pleasure for us to do that. We've got some wonderful talks coming up. Uh, including members of the admissions committee. So we want to get the word out that we think that this has been something that's been helpful and will be helpful to you and to your careers. On behalf of the, uh, our wonderful cardiologist guest tonight, on behalf of the working group uh, for virtual shadowing, we want to say thank you so much for coming and we wish you a good evening and a good night. Thank you guys so much.